my religion is the Essene religion, uh, Essene Judaism. The roots of Essene Judaism go back all the way to approximately the second century uh, BC is when we have the the earliest uh, records of a distinct group that it resembles the Essene group. Of course, there were, for instance, Adam. Adam was not a Jew, so he, his religion was not Judaism. But um, it's the same religion as Judaism, just his was, a, his was not identified as Judaism. So similarly, the Essene religion, prior to the second century, was not, did not have the, the Essene name. It was, it had the, the, the basic concepts and teachings of the Essene group. But prior to the second century, there were, it was essentially Judaism, and it was a, a strongly unified uh, religion. It was pretty much Judaism, and then there were other, there was basically the, the different heretical groups that weren't like official. So for instance, in the first temple age, there were the, all the Jews who were worshiping other gods, you know? So at any rate, getting off topic. Um, so the Essenes originated approximately the second century BC. And the sources we have for what they believed, what they uh, taught, are contained primarily in uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, but also an important source is con contemporaries of the Essenes in the first century AD, about to the fourth century AD. We have different individuals who had contact with the Essenes and they reported what their beliefs and these individuals, the main important ones are Josephus. He was considering possibly converting to the Essenes. He, he was looking into all different groups of Judaism, trying to see which group he should convert to. So Josephus actually had a personal interaction with them and found out what they believed, firsthand account. Uh, and so he actually wrote in his writings that we have their system of belief. And what's interesting is even though Josephus was not a, a seen convert, he focuses a, a lot on their beliefs more than the other groups. He doesn't talk too much about the Pharisee beliefs or the Samaritan beliefs, but he puts a lot of emphasis on the Essene. Um, Philo, who was another Jew in the first century, he, he also had an interaction and uh, received first-hand account of things they believed, things they taught. So those are the two primary sources, and a third source of what they believed is basically the books they consider scripture. Uh, so the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in around 1948. That was the beginning of when they first came to be found. There were 11 caves in all in which the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, but they weren't all found in the year 1948. That's just when they started finding, they, like, they found the first cave and then they found other caves as the years went on. Within a couple, within one or two decades, they found 10 other caves. So altogether were, there were 11 caves they found. And the exact count is debatable, but they found about 900 or so unique scrolls, which had different texts, um, all of them religious texts. Um, so, um, let me see what I'm going to go back. So I want to start basically telling a very interesting story 
that I believe uh, it's so unique and it's like almost like magical that it convinces me that the Dead Sea Scrolls are a very significant thing and that um, and that God he he manipulated things in such a way so that the Dead Sea Scrolls would be found and he wanted them to be found so that he could restore something that has been lost he, he wants us to restore it but he's not going to he's not going to force us to restore the truth. He wants us to do it, but he's giving us nudges and and hints and trying to he wants us to open our own eyes. He doesn't want to force forcibly open our eyes. So I believe the Dead Sea Scrolls is proof uh, th this story the story about the Dead Sea Scrolls that I'm about to tell is, is proof that the Dead Sea Scrolls are key to restoring the true religion. Um, so when the, D, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, how it was found, let me see, I wrote, I wrote up a thing, which is a quotation from other writers, which gives a brief synopsis of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I'm just going to read that. Um, so it says, in the spring of 1947, Bedouin goat herds searching the cliffs along the Dead Sea for a lost goat came upon a cave containing jars filled with manuscripts. That find caused a sensation when it was released to the world and continues to fascinate the scholarly community and the public to this day. The first discoveries came to the attention of scholars in 1948 when seven of the scrolls were sold by the Bedouin to a cobbler and antiquities dealer. He in turn sold three of the scrolls to Eliezer Sukenik of Hebrew University and four scrolls to Metropolitan Mar Athanasius Yeshua Samuel of the Syrian Orthodox Monastery of St. Mark. Mar Athanasius, in turn, brought his four to the American School of Oriental Research, where they came to the attention of American and European scholars. It was not until 1949 that the site of the find was identified as the cave now known as Qumran Cave 1. It was that identification that led to further explorations and, cave and excavations of the Urbet Qumran. Further search of Cave 1 revealed archaeological finds of pottery, cloth, and wood, as well as a number of additional manuscript fragments. It was these discoveries that proved decisively that the scrolls were indeed ancient and authentic. Between 1949 and 1956, in what became a race between the Bedouin and the archaeologists, ten additional caves were found in the hills around Qumran, caves that yielded several more scrolls, as well as thousands of fragments of scrolls, the remnants of approximately 800 manuscripts dating from approximately 200 BC to 68 CE. The manuscripts of the Qumran caves include early copies of biblical books in Hebrew and Aramaic, hymns, prayers, Jewish writings known as pseudepigrapha because they are attributed to ancient biblical characters such as Enoch or the patriarchs, and texts that seem to represent the beliefs of a particular Jewish group that may have lived at the site of Qumran. So that's a very little write-up of it. So basically this story is uh, they were trying, they, a goat wandered off and they were trying to follow the goat and they followed the goat to this first cave, and that's what, start, that's what led them to find this, the Dead Sea Scrolls. A second thing happened. The fourth cave that they found was also found by an animal. The, the Arabs, the Bedouin Arabs, were trying to find, um, I'm not sure if they were trying to find more caves at the time, but basically what happened is a bird they, they saw a bird flying, and they were they followed the bird, and then it, it got stuck in between something. So they went to go in and look what happened to the bird, and they found this cave. Uh, it was actually two different caves, but scholars refer to it as just one cave, Cave Four, because uh, the the divider between the two caves broke, and so it became one cave. Um, so this fourth cave. 
was probably it was the uh, the biggest uh, find for the Dead Sea Scrolls. All the other caves had about 10, 15, maybe 20, sometimes up to 30 scrolls. But the the fourth cave had the majority of the scrolls. It had hundreds and hundreds. About it had about 550 unique scrolls. So this fourth cave was found by this bird that they were following. So um, two two stories of animals, okay? Um, and what's interesting too is that of the 11 caves, the majority of them were found by the Bedouins, who were not considered experts at archaeology. They're just regular people who know the land, uh, but they they didn't get an education in archaeology. But they found most of the caves, and the and the the official archaeologists um, who were trying to find more caves. They they were the experts, and they could only find a couple caves, and the caves they found were very insignificant. Uh, the most significant thing that they did find the archaeologists is the third cave, which had the uh, famous copper scroll. But so it just goes to show that he God often uses uh, what's considered weak by the world, you know, just regular Arab Bedouins who had no education, pretty much. Uh, they were able to do much better in finding caves than the expert archaeologists. So that's pretty interesting. But so the story gets really interesting right now because the Dead Sea Scrolls were not first discovered, or let me rephrase it, the discovery in 1948 was not the first discovery of Dead Sea Scrolls. There is actually an, an ancient secret that a lot of scholars know about, but most regular people don't really know about too much. It is basically this, that about 1100 years before these Dead Sea Scrolls were found, there were some other Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in the same basic area. And the story is eerily similar. It's really striking. Um, so I'm going to read. Uh, I'm going to read this letter that was written about um, a thousand years ago of this discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So it says right here: We have learned from certain Jews that who are worthy of credence, who have recently been converted to Christianity that ten years ago some books were discovered in the vicinity of Jericho in a cave dwelling in the mountain. They say that the dog of an Arab who was hunting game went into a cleft after an animal and did not come out. His owner then went in after him and found a chamber inside the mountain containing many books. The huntsman went to Jerusalem and reported this to some Jews. A lot of people set off and arrived there. They found books of the Old Testament and apart from that, other books in Hebrew script. Because the person who told me this knows the script and is skilled in reading it, I asked him about certain verses adduced in our New Testament as being from the Old Testament, but of which there is no mention at all in the Old Testament, neither among us Christians nor among the Jews. He told me that they were to be found in the books that had been discovered there. When I heard this from the Katitumen, I asked other people as well besides him, and I discovered the same story without any difference. I wrote about the matter to the resplendent Gabriel and also to Shabhal Maran, Met Metropolitan of Damascus, in order that they might make investigation into these books and see if there is to be found in the prophets that seal he will be called Nazarene, or that which eye has not seen and ear has not heard. First is everyone who is hung on the wood or he turned back the boundary to Israel in accordance with the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Jonah the prophet, who are adduced by the New Testament and the Old Testament, but which are not to be found at all in the Bible we possess. I further asked him if they found these phrases in those books, by all means to translate them. For it is written, Have mercy, O God, according to your grace, sprinkle upon me with the hyssop of the blood of your cross and cleanse me. 
This phrase is not in the Septuagint, nor in the other versions, nor in the Hebrew. Um, now, that Hebrew man told me, we found a David among those books containing more than 200 songs. I wrote concerning all this to them. I suppose that these books may have been deposited either by Jeremiah the prophet or by Baruch or by someone else from those who heard the word of plunder and burning that was going to come upon the people as a result of their sins, being men who were firmly assured that not one of God's words would fall to the earth. They hid the books in the mountains and caves to prevent their being burnt by fire or taken as plunder by captors. Then those who had hidden them died after a period of 70 or fewer years, and when the people returned from Babylon, there was no one surviving of those who had deposited the books. This is why Ezra and others had to make investigations, thus discovering what books the Hebrews possessed. The Bible among the Hebrews consists of three volumes, one being the volume which the 70 interpreters subsequently translated for King Ptolemy, who was worthy of a wreath of accolades, Another was the volume from which others translated at a later time, while the third is preserved amongst them. If any of these phrases are to be found in the books, it will be evident that they are more reliable than the texts in currency among the Hebrews and among us. Although I wrote, I have received no answer from them on this matter. I have not got anyone sufficiently capable with me whom I can send. The matter has been like a burning fire in my heart, and it has set my bones alight. All right, so that's the letter. Um, so the correspondence between the two stories couldn't be more striking, because here's why. In both accounts, an Arab Bedouin is searching after an animal that went astray. In both accounts, the animal leads the Arab Bedouin to the caves where the manuscripts are. In both, the, the Bedouin informs the Jews, and scholars travel in mass to the site. In both, the books were, were found in the same general vicinity, near Jericho, in the Dead Sea region. And in both accounts, influential leaders in the Syrian Orthodox Church are involved and greatly interested in the find and seek to get access to the books found. And in both, many apocryphal books, as well as biblical books, were found. And in both, more than 200 Psalms attributed to David were found. In both are additional writings found in Hebrew, and in both are writings reflective of scriptures and readings of scripture which correspond greater with quotations of scripture in the New Testament and the Septuagint. Um, and what's also interesting is the Syrian Orthodox Church is the only Christian group that in their version of the Book of Psalms, in some of their manuscripts, they have they have four extra psalms, Psalms 152 to 155. These very psalms that are only in the Syriac Bible are also, were also found in the Dead Sea Scrolls in uh, the 1948 um, discoveries. So these very psalms found only in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in the Syriac Bible, uh, this suggests that this discovery 1,000 years ago, years ago was the source of the Syrian Bible having these additional Psalms in their Bible. And so it's like, what are the odds that the Syrian Orthodox would have these Psalms in their Bible and the Dead Sea Scrolls would have it in their Bible and that this Dead Sea Scroll event happened 1,000 years ago, about the same time that the, that the Syrian Bible started having these Psalms. It all fits together. So this story to me convinces me that the, the Dead Sea Scrolls are crucial to restoring a true religion because of this story, like, it's like identical story. And especially like the animal, the animals involved. So to me, the, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls was not an accident, was not a coincidence, but it was a divine, divinely inspired, divinely led event. Um, if this is the case, then we should really be looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls and studying them and seeing how can we use these to restore the true faith? I also am going to mention some other things that are unique um, in regards to the first discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls about a thousand years ago. The earlier story, the source is in a letter that uh, Timotheus the first, if you look him up, that's his name, Timotheus the first, and he wrote a letter 
I can send you a link later. Um, and in this letter, he, he writes, and what's really interesting is, um, you know how on my Facebook I put like a status about how my eyes are hurting so much. Um, he actually like writes about his eyes hurting. It's just funny, but. Um, so he must have had a similar issue that I'm having. Um, in relation to the, the study of these, the deep study of manuscript differences. Um, so there is a really interesting place um, known as Cairo Geniza. A Geniza was a place for rabbis to store texts in uh, for their preservation. Um, it was in the back of synagogues in a back room. And in Cairo Geniza, this is owned by, by Jews. Um, they stored a bunch of writings there, writings from their own religion, so like a Talmud, uh, Orthodox Judaism, but they also had writings from Karite Judaism, which is their actual, that was their opposing group. And they had, um, they had writings from Christians and from Muslims, uh, all in this Cairo Geniza. But what's really striking is in this Geniza, there are a few writings that were there, which were found nowhere else except in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And these writings were, in particular, the Testament of Levi, the Aaron, which much fuller than the Greek version, was much fuller than the Greek version, and then the uh, the Damascus document. This so Cairo Genesis had this Essene writing called the Damascus document, which is found elsewhere only in the Dead Sea Scrolls. How did they come to get this document of the Damascus? It it's just doesn't make sense how they could have this text when the Essenes died out hundreds and hundreds of years before that. The answer seems to be that this earlier discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, in which, because people don't change, um, as you know, Solomon says, uh, things will always be, things have always been and they will always be, you know. So, um, these scholars, just like modern day scholars, like, they ate it up and went and, like, you know, we're trying to do the same thing that they, they uh, have done today. And what's interesting is that there's a document called Hebrew Testament of Naphtali. And when you compare the Hebrew version to the Greek, there are so many differences, but there's also some similarities. But then there's readings from the Testament of Joseph in the Testament of Naphtali. So what I believe happened is that uh, the, the scholars reconstructed the Testament of Naphtali like a thousand years ago, just like the scholars do today with the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found in the 20th century. Because the scrolls are often fragmentary due to you know time, as time goes on, the scrolls start to deteriorate. So. In the 20th century, scholars, what they had to do, because it was so fragmentary most of the time, they had to try to reconstruct it, some of the missing portions, or they had to try to fit the pieces together. There was a bunch of fragments, and they're saying, this fragment seems to fit with this scroll, so we're going to put all these fragments together as if there were one scroll. So if they do it carefully, they can be very correct, but oftentimes their reconstruction is very flawed and they're putting pieces together that were never supposed to be together. So they come up with a text that is actually a text that's not really valid at all. So I believe something very similar happened with the Hebrew Testament of Naphtali. But so the Cairo Genesis is just another piece of evidence for the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, so these two instances, I believe was God trying to lead us back to or to help us restore the faith, uh, the true faith. So with that said, now I'm going to, um, I'm just going to give like some, an overview of the basic Essene things. Can so I ask Essene you a question first? That's where Can I ask you a question first? Sure, yes. Uh, Timotheus, yep. uh, um, my understanding was that they found that piece of the, the Zadokite document 
in the Geniza, and the Karaites were formed in part from that fragment. Is that the correct? Uh, some people have tried to tell me that the Karaites date clear back to Old Testament times, but from what I've read, the Karaites date from the 9th century when that piece was found in the Geniza. Yeah, it's like um, there were certain groups, uh, like for instance, the they identify with the Sadducees, I think. Um, so there were certain groups that you know, might have had some similarities with some of their, the Karai ideas. Um, it seems to be the best answer, what you just said, the best explanation for the origin of the Karai movement, but it also sometimes agreed with the Sadducees too. So there are, there were some connections between the Essenes and Sadducees. But so I, I would say it's prob probably that the Karaites originated from that, but at least for me, there's a small amount of doubt that, which makes it uncertain to me okay. that that's the case. Um, yeah, anything the, else? Or that uh, yes, uh, that's good. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, like good. you said, it's probably the best explanation, but nobody knows. Explanation, but nobody knows. Yeah, that's the tentative answer, I think. And then, you know, more research, more research might lead to more conclusions. Okay, we got another one okay. joining now. So, sorry for the interruption, okay. but when somebody joins, it'll make that noise. Yeah, that's fine. How, how many we have now? We've got at least uh, seven, eight, but there's people out there on the web watching, too. And I don't know who they are. And I don't know who they are. Hello to you all. Shalom. 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 Uh, oh, by the way, so I'm gonna continue for, with this, way, for yeah. you newcomers, make sure to for turn your mic and camera sure off. Turn your mic and camera off. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, I'm just going to give a, a general overview of the the basic uh, parts of the Essene religion, which found it on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, but then, what I'm going to try to do is try to explain why I myself am in a scene uh, and why I'm convinced the Messiah and the Apostles were also Essenes. Uh, I'm going to show some interesting things about that. So basically the Dead Sea Scrolls, as I said, there was about 800 to 900 different texts that were found in the 20th century. and. A lot of them are fragmentary and uncertain what they are, but a good number of them have enough preserved that we can identify what they are. And often it has very significant um, implications. So the texts that were found are basically divided into the, the following things. There's um, their version of the Law of Moses was very peculiar. It was much longer, different order often, but so they had they had a bunch of different uh, different manuscripts of the Law of Moses claiming to be written by Moses, which had extra commandments uh, and a bunch of things. So that that was a foundational thing of their of their religion. The uh, different Torah. The they also had a different book of Psalms. There were, there were the, the book of Psalms was one of the most uh, popular books in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And like, there was about 40 copies of the book of Psalms, most of them fragmentary. Uh, but a good number of those copies clearly represent a, com a very different version of the book of Psalms, basically, in this version that the Essenes had in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, well, let me just say this. The, the Masoretic text, the regular version of the Book of Psalms in most people's Bibles, you're going to see something in there when you look. If you look later, you'll see there are five different sections in the Book of Psalms uh, called, they, they it calls it Book 1, Book 2, Book 3, Book 4, and Book 5 uh, in, in the... Uh, 
Masoretic version and in most people's uh, Bible versions of the Psalms, you'll see that. So in the Dead Sea Scrolls version, what we see is that the first three books of the Book of Psalms were mostly the same, with just slight differences. But then Book Four uh, was uh, different a lot, but still, for the majority of it, was the same. But there was enough differences uh, to make it like, very unique. And about the, the last section, section five, which is so book five, in the Dead Sea Scroll version of Psalms, it's like completely different. And um, when I say completely different, I mean, I mean this. The book of Psalms in the Dead Sea Scrolls has all 150 Psalms. Uh, well, not all of them were found in manuscript copies because of it being fragmentary, but we can assume, we have no reason to think otherwise, that any of the 150 psalms were not in their version. But what the difference was is the psalms in that, the latter half of the book were like rearranged in a very different order. And in addition, there were about 14 extra psalms in their version of the Book of Psalms. So about, they had about 162 Psalms rather than 150 in their version of Book of Psalms. Um, so, and also in, at near the very end of their version of the Book of Psalms, they have a, a passage which says that King David, he composed all those songs by prophecy. And he also composed, it says, he wrote a total of 4,050 uh, songs and psalms altogether. And um, 3,600 were psalms, uh, and 450 were songs that he wrote. And so we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls that the Essenes took that literally, and they believe that David actually did write. 4,050 uh, different compositions of a psalm or song nature. And so we see that not only did the Essenes and the Dead Sea Scrolls have this book of psalms, but they also had other psalms uh, claiming to be by David, which were very similar in content to the book of psalms that we have. Um, very, very similar theme, style of authorship, but just different. It's different content. It's extra psalms, and we see a bunch of these compositions. So that there's, there were at least like approximately a hundred different songs or psalms found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were not in our in our version of the Book of Psalms, and most of them claim to be based on their authorship, they're presenting themselves, uh, excuse me, based on their style of authorship, they're presenting themselves as a composition of David. And so in the, in the book of Psalms that they had, it's that King David wrote 364 songs for all the days of the year, for the sacrifices for each day, because in the Torah, we are told every day there has to be a sacrifice by the priests. So David wrote a a song for all 364 days of the year. That's what their version of the Book of Psalms says. And we also see it says he wrote 52 songs for the sacrifices of the Sabbath. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, one-fourth of the Sabbath songs have been preserved. So we have about 13 songs for the Sabbath sacrifice. So it's pretty clear, based on the Book of Psalms they had, that the Essenes believed that David was the author of these Sabbath songs. And um, we also had festival songs. David, David said he wrote, uh, or excuse me, the book of Psalms that they had says that he wrote 30 festival songs. And when we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we see certain compositions which are so songs for the festivals. Like there's one for the Day of Atonement, one for the, the, the Tabernacle Days. So we see a clear correspondence here. So the Essenes evidently believe that these festival songs were one and the same with the festival songs that their version of the Book of Psalms refers to. And what's interesting is in Cairo Geniza, 
which I mentioned earlier, which has connections which, with the Dead Sea Scrolls, there were four songs that were found, which were songs for the day, for, for the day daily songs of the year. And they're so similar in style to David, it's, it's, it's 100% certain that they were uh, claiming to be written by David. So this document in Cairo Genesis um, supports the, the book of Psalms in their version, which says that he wrote a song, a song for each day of the year. Unfortunately, we only have four of the days of the year from Cairo Genesis, but we are to, we have no reason to think otherwise that all the days of the year are originally in a book um, that claimed to be written by David. So these, these extra songs were very much a part of the heart and spirit of the Dead Sea School community. There were so many different writings of these songs that were found. Um, so there was the, uh, another thing of, that is a huge part of the Dead Sea Scrolls was basically writings that represent Enochian Judaism. The basic premise of Enochian Judaism is that Enoch is central figure to their faith, and he is he is of like the utmost authority, perhaps even more authoritative more authoritative than the Torah itself because he predates the Law of Moses. So the Torah is actually founded on Enoch's writings. That's the whole concept of Enochian Judaism, that Enoch is the foundation of our faith. So Enoch and the Torah are the foundation of our faith, not just Torah. That's the basic premise of Enochian Judaism. And Enoch, as we know from Genesis, was um, he was he walked with God and was very righteous, and then because he was so in uni unity with God, he was taken away as a blessing, and he did not die, according to Genesis' account. Uh, so, this Enoch, according to the Essene writings and according to many other sources, wrote some wrote some books, and these books are the foundation of the the Essene religion. And, but not only, like most people know about the Book of Enoch. That's kind of a key text that a lot of people are aware of because it's, it's been so popular. Uh, but other texts of Enochian Judaism has, have not been so popular, primarily due to their being fragmentarily preserved in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But these other texts that we have that represent an Enochian type of Judaism are as follows. In the Dead Sea Scrolls were, was found a book claiming to be written by Lamech. Lamech was the father of Noah. Okay, and in this book, um, it has it is very similar to one of the last chapters of the Book of Enoch. So there, there, there's a connection right there. It seems evident that Enoch, in First Enoch, the Book of Enoch, uh, derived the story about Noah's birth. Uh, from the book of Lamech because the book of Lamech gives much fuller details not discussed in the book of Enoch and um, it also represents it in the first person account from Lamech's point of view and Enoch features in, in, that, uh, in the book of Lamech he writes some, some more prophecies and things like that unfortunately it's very, as I said, very fragmentarily preserved the book of Lamech is included as a part of what scholars call the, Gen the Genesis Apocryphon. Okay? Another text in the Genesis Apocryphon is the Book of Noah. The Book of Noah, you know, it claims, so it claims to be written by Noah, first-hand account says, I, Noah, and what's very interesting is that it has intimate connections with the Book of Jubilees. Things found only in the Book of Jubilees are also found in the Book of Noah. So, the evidence seems to indicate that Jubilees used the Book of Noah as a source. So, so we have Book of Lamech and Book of Noah, and then another text in the Genesis Apocryphon was a Book of Abraham. This too has connections with the Book of Jubilees. So all this 
all of these texts are a unity, a textual unity, and it all represents the same type of Enochian Judaism type mentality. Uh, in the book of Abraham, it even mentions Enoch's books by name, and Abraham says that he taught the Egyptians wisdom from the books of Enoch. So you see, the, the, um, these texts that the Essenes had, they, they were, it was all a unified theme of, of the Enoch teachings. Um, there was, in, in Jubilees, we are told that Jacob wrote a book which had his own account of what happened in his life. Unfortunately, most of that book has not been uh, found in any manuscripts. There are a few fragments in the Dead Sea Scrolls that might be from this book. Um, and there are, there's, for instance, the Ladder of Jacob is, a, is an apocryphal text that was preserved separately. That was probably part of the Book of Jacob originally. But knowing, so knowing the Essenes uh, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, we can be confident that they did have a copy of the Book of Jacob um, because they had it of Abraham, Noah, Lamech, and it was all a unity, and it was in perfect correspondence with Jubilees, the narrative of Jubilees. Um, and there are writings in Dead Sea Scrolls which were written by the Essenes which cite Jubilees as an authority, a scriptural authority. So the fact that they considered Jubilees to be scripture means that they also considered, they accepted everything it said, or at least they tried to, how they understood it, what it was trying to say. And so they, they obviously understood that um, Noah and Abraham and Lamech and Jacob actually wrote these apocryphal texts based on what Jubilees claims. Um, and so that's the main text of Enochian Judaism. There were also, however, part of Enochian Judaism, but somewhat separated from the idea, was the Testament literature. The Testament literature was basically when the patriarchs were, basically, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their 12 sons, when they were on their deathbed, they gave their last words, and a lot of their words were prophetic. Um, we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, manuscripts of the Testament of Levi, Levi the son of Jacob. We, we find Testament of Naphtali, uh, the last words of Naphtali, son of Jacob. There are also fragments which may be from the Testament of Judah, but it's unclear because of how fragmentary it is. Um, but so we, it's evident that the Essenes accepted the testament, the testaments of the patriarchs, as as um, as scripture, especially since they had Essene writings. Uh, excuse me, their their writings that they wrote quote the testament of Levi as the very words of Levi himself. So they they based on that. Uh, considered the testaments as truly written uh, by the patriarchs. They also had in Dead Sea Scrolls a testament of Amram and a testament of Koath. Koath was the son of Levi, and Amram was the son of Koath and the father of Moses and uh, Aaron. So they had these testaments of these individuals. There was also writings which have more stories about Moses and Joshua. So there was an, a Joshua Apocryphon that they had in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And also uh, there were some extra writings that they had about Moses. So that's primarily the Enochian Judaism concept that, that the Dead Sea Scrolls teaches and the Essenes that was part of their faith. Next. Next, which is connected to the text, is the calendar text. Basically, in the calendar, they, they had um, a bunch of scrolls which present a peculiar calendar for the observance of the festivals, uh, the Sabbaths. And they 
had in their writings both a solar calendar and a lunar calendar. They used both for certain functions. But since we know that they considered Jubilee's scripture and Enoch's scripture, we know that they uh, did not consider the lunar calendar to be the the basis of the of the festivals when they are, when the Sabbaths are. We even as I mentioned earlier, the Sabbath songs of David, in the Sabbath songs of David, he actually gives the date of the year when each Sabbath was to occur. And these dates for the Sabbath do not correspond with a lunar Sabbath. Uh, they correspond with the 364-day uh, year, the solar year, that Enoch and Jubilees endorse. And because they accepted Jubilees, and Jubilees says that uh, it, it actually claims to prophesy of, in the later, the latter days, of the majority of Jews forgetting about the true feasts and the true calendar and going away to false feasts, going away to false Sabbaths, based on the observance of the moon. So basically, the writer of Jubilees um, was predicting his own religion being uh, diminished. And so, the, um, sorry, one second, let me just try to refocus here. Um, so, Jubilees shows that it seems considered the solar calendar as the basis of when the feasts are to be observed. They have a document in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which actually is a commentary on the flood account of Genesis. What's very interesting is when you do the math of the, of the account of Genesis, it does not add up with a lunar calendar. The, it, it gives the dates of when the events happened for the flood, and those dates lead to the conclusion that prior to the flood, months were 30 days long in length. Uh, in, a lunar, in a lunar calendar, months are not 30 days long. They alternate between 29 days and 30, usually every other month. But according to Genesis, five consecutive months were each 30 days long, which only works in a solar calendar like Enoch's and Jubilees. So the Essenes actually have a commentary on the Genesis count, which, goes, which like basically does the math for you and tells you what on which day what happened, and what day of the week it was. And so when we look at all the writings of the calendar text in the Essene writings, it becomes clear that they absolutely did not consider the moon to be the main basis of the observance. They did utilize it somewhat because they, they have cycles of the moon. They have it written down uh, of keeping the year intact through synchronization between the solar and the lunar year. But um, all the evidence of what the actual text that they have in the Dead Sea Scrolls indicates that the Essenes did, uh, were a solar-only group in regards to what days of the year, um, how many days of the month there were, how many days of the year there were. It was all based on the sun. Uh, and, you know, if um, we have to see what the, the, to the Torah says and the, so if the, you know, if the Torah teaches the lunar calendar, then we need to go with the lunar calendar. But if it, uh, so I know there are some people who believe that the scriptures teach a lunar calendar. And, but so the Essenes obviously did not agree. They interpreted all the passages that other people interpret as supporting the lunar calendar as the system. They interpreted those passages as actually uh, reconciling with the solar calendar view. Um, but so there's a lot of other writings too that just uh, match up with the solar calendar. For instance, in Revelation in the New Testament, there it mentions that there are um, 42 months and then it tells how many days those are and it's 1260 days. Now when you do the math, 1260 days divided by 42 months, that is um, 
that is 48 consecutive uh, months, all 30 days long in length, which is impossible in a lunar calendar. So there's a lot of there's a lot of sources that uh, point to the solar calendar being the correct. But um, anyway, that's the Essene viewpoint. Um, let's see here. They also had um, there there were apocryphal prophets, writings of the uh, claims given by the prophets, and a lot of them are unidentified because of how fragmentary they are. But the ones we can identify, there are writings from them claiming to be by Jeremiah, by Ezekiel, and either by Daniel or Habakkuk. Uh, it's unclear. But so there were there was like a book of prophecy about Daniel, either written claiming to be written by Daniel or by Habakkuk. And there were there seems to have been a writing by Samuel in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so there were there were many prophetic texts that they had, but most of them are fragmentary, unfortunately. But so that was a very much, prophecy was a huge part of their faith, because according to Josephus, he taught that prophecy had ceased among the Pharisees, but that the Essenes still had the gift of prophecy, even after the Pharisees lost it. And so they, prophecy was a very prominent part of their religion according to the Dead Sea Scrolls and according to Josephus' um, independent testimony. So basically the Essenes were like the, the Pentecostal version of Judaism, except not as crazy as the Pentecostals. Um, so then there was Essene literature. This literature is unique in Dead Sea Scrolls in that these were writings by the Essenes themselves. With, so they weren't texts that the Essenes like preserved from their forefathers. They were writings that they invented, that they knew was their own, from their own ideas. Because as I said, they considered themselves prophets, and they were regarded as prophets by, by um, according to Josephus, pagans considered them prophets because their pro their predictions would be correct in a way that was unbelievable. Um, but the so that would convince a lot of the. Uh, like some of the Greeks who were um, who were had authority over them in the second century. Um, so these writings were authored by the Essenes, and these are the ones, the main ones in particular. They had something called a pesher. That's what scholars refer to it as. It's a Hebrew word, and pesher basically means interpretation. But the way it's used in the Bible seems to be more like an inspired interpretation or an authoritative interpretation. In the book of Daniel, for instance, when Daniel is interpreting the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar, it uses this word pesher to basically mean the true interpretation. Uh, so these writings that they had, the pesher, was designed to give the true interpretation of certain scriptures. Based on what we have, it seems that they only authored Pesher documents on the scrolls that everyone accepted, the books that everyone accepted. So the regular, the regular Old Testament. So that would be um, the Minor Prophets, uh, Hosea all the way to Malachi, and also uh, Isaiah and some of the other prophets and the Book of Psalms. We have in the Dead Sea Scrolls we have a pesher of Habakkuk, we have a pesher of Zephaniah, we have one for Hosea, um, we have one for Isaiah, and there might be one for Micah, it's uncertain, um, but so there were a lot of peshers that they had, which in these texts, uh, they try to give the, they try to apply those texts to their, to their own lives and into their history. Um, so that's the Pesher. That's a source for some of our understanding of who the Essenes were historically as a group. Um, there was also a text called the War Scroll. The War Scroll was claims to be a revelation of 
a final war in the last days, which is supposed to be fought by all of Israel who are faithful. And this war, we have detailed instructions of how to fight it. This war has not happened yet, but according to the Essene faith, it is supposed to happen, it has to happen because it's prophecy. And it's also presented to us as actual commandments. So it gives a bunch of commandments of how to fight this war. It's going to be a 40 year long war. So as part of my faith, uh, of the Essene faith, I believe that there is going to eventually be a 40 year war involving most of the world. Um, and it's going to be fought according to these regulations that the war scroll has. So that's the perspective of the Essenes. It would, they had an eschatological uh, emphasis. They believed that they were in the last days. And that, um, so that was a very much a big part of their faith as well. And then the final part of their writings, uh, their own writings were basically uh, writings of their covenant. They believed that they were in the new covenant and they had, there are several writings. There's the Damascus document, which I mentioned earlier, which was found in Cairo Genesis. So there was, Cairo, uh, there was a Damascus document and there was community rule. And there were a bunch of other texts, which probably are fragments of either Damascus documents or community rule. But it's so fragmentary, it's hard to know exactly if they were from those books or from some other book. But so they had, um, they, the extra writings they wrote gives basically their beliefs of what the new covenant requires. It has some extra it has some extra commandments that are not in the, the Law of Moses, and it has a bunch of... So these these uh, documents, the it represents what they call them in their own words, they call it the New, Te the New Covenant, and they give their own interpretation of the law, and uh, so they have a very peculiar presentation of their understanding of the law, and it very often differs from the Pharisees interpretation and so um, now I'm going to just some of the things that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls they had what's known as phylacteries and mezuzah which th these are basically it's an interpretation of the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Exodus which says bind the words to your forehead and to your arm the Pharisees took this literally, and the Essenes also took this literally, because we have in the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, these very te uh, items, and and these items um, we know that these are these were by the Essenes, and here's how we know, because according to the Pharisee concept of the of the phylacteries. You have to put, you, you, according to the concept, to put some words inside the box. But the words that the Pharisees say are not the words that are found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The, the words that are found in the Dead Sea Scrolls are very different. Um, it's much lengthier than what the Pharisees said are to be in the phylacteries. So we know that these were not, uh, they did not have these phylacteries as like preserving the Pharisee things, but we, these were actually their own, their own ones, uh, because it reflects a peculiar, a peculiar type. So in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have writings in Hebrew, Aramaic, and a few in Greek, which shows that they uh, had a lot of proficiency with different languages. But the Dead Sea Scrolls are very significant in regards to linguistic a study of scholars because before the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, it was basically assumed that Hebrew was a dead language in the first century. So there was pretty much no debate about whether or not Messiah spoke Hebrew or Aramaic. They pretty much all believed it was Aramaic. Of course it was Aramaic. That was, you know, Hebrew died out. That was what they, that was what scholars believed. But when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, that assumption changed uh, and challenge that idea. So now it's generally believed by scholars that Hebrew did not die out, but it was still very active, although there was a very strong presence of Aramaic. Oh, and they also had Paleo-Hebrew, uh, paleo 
which is a certain type of script. Like, you know, so in English, we have regular writing, then we have cursive. It's similar in that type of sense. So we have the regular Hebrew that we're familiar with, but then we have a older type of Hebrew, which scholars refer to as Paleo-Hebrew. It's the original script of what Hebrew actually looked like. So this was the Hebrew that Moses saw when he was writing the Torah. You know, so the Paleo-Hebrew that they have uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's pretty much only used for writing which are ancient. Uh, so basically writing the ones we have in Paleo-Hebrew, we have it of uh, Job, of the books of the Torah, and we have it of Joshua. So we have indications of Paleo-Hebrew being reserved for the most ancient and authoritative books. Um, and also the divine name. Uh, we have some copies where the divine name is spelled out in regular Hebrew. Other copies, it's, it's spelled out in Paleo-Hebrew uniquely. All the rest is regular Hebrew, but they use Paleo-Hebrew for the divine name. But then there's other texts, other manuscripts they have, which omit the name entirely and substitute it with some with four dots. This was a similar practice that uh, sometimes of Pharisees of substituting the name, uh, and many people have an issue with that. But according to the Essene understanding, the divine name is holy. We are to use it, including with those uh, out, with outsiders, but we are to protect it as well. We're not to just rashly use it. And so uh, the Essenes protected it. So in their writings, which were intended for, for common use, they did not use the name because they did not want it being subjected to common use um, because it's holy. The writings which were um, the, the manuscript copies which not everyone had access to, uh, these had the, the name written out. So that's the Essene understanding of, you know, sanctifying the name, uh, not bringing it to, a, to sunder. Now, I'm going to just mention the, um, the basic ideas of the Essenes. So, basically, the origin of the Essenes, as I mentioned earlier, was approximately the 2nd century B.C. It, the Basically, it, it derived from the Maccabean incident of what happened was... Oh, you. Yeah? Hey, uh, I'm sorry to I'm break sorry. in here in, in the middle of your discourse. Um, I'm going to have to roll off myself here in a couple of minutes. But I wanted to know if uh, you're going to accept questions possibly tomorrow, maybe on a Facebook post or something. Um, I only really had one question, and it's something I don't know if it's going to be, a, it's not anything related to the, to the manuscripts themselves or anything like that. It's more related to the practical aspects of all of it and how we apply some of the stuff to our life. And over, um, what would a person who observes Torah as people understand it now, um, you know, the Maserat Torah as you're calling it, have indifference or it's whatever to, to you know the Essene faith in that sense. Like, uh, uh, can, like, you, like, 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 can you repeat the question? The question? May I yeah, it's uh, 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 an echo. Yeah, one sec, you, uh, Jackson, you want to interrupt? No, no, we've been no, here, no, we've been here right. Oh, sorry. This is not a time for questions and answers. Oni has the floor. Please keep your questions for later. Yeah, all right. Good good call. So basically, David, my intention was to ask him if he would be willing to accept questions later on a post. All I need is a yes or no to that. Okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah, definitely. I. I, we didn't know how much time we were going to have today, and depending on the interest, we would have either another, we would have more talk, but definitely at the very least, uh, a post, uh, you know, or various posts, and just, you know, any, any questions are welcome. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Shalom.
All right, so, so basically the Essene movement originated from the conflict uh, in the second century when Antiochus rose up, and most of you were probably familiar with the story where he tried to eradicate Judaism, um, and basically whoever refused to abandon Judaism, he tortured brutally and tried to kill them, and he killed a lot of uh, people who were trying to keep Torah, you know, he, we, a lot of us would, would be dead right now, uh, or we would be apostates um, if we had an Antiochus today. So we are actually very lucky, even though the world is pretty horrible, it's nothing like it was in the time of Antiochus where uh, it was so much persecution. They actually died for their faith. God always, like, according to the book of Esther, he raises people up to try to save, he, he raises someone to save his people because he made a promise to Israel that they would not be eradicated. So he raised up the Maccabees and they basically restored Israel and uh, purified the temple. And so it is my understanding based on my study of the history and the Dead Sea Scrolls that the actual Maccabees themselves were the Essene founders. So uh, Jonathan and um, Judas Maccabee and uh, these, these people, uh, basically they went into the wilderness uh, to renew the covenant, so they made a new covenant um, because they were being persecuted. And so uh, that was the basic idea. They, they fled into the wilderness and a bunch of people came to them because they, you know, they didn't want to die, but they wanted to kept, keep Torah. So even in that time, Pharisees, they didn't identify as Pharisee at the time, but they joined with the Essene people, with the Maccabees, because they didn't want to die. And they united together for a common purpose of protecting Torah. Once, however, the, the temple was purified and they kind of got some control over Israel again, then there was a division between the, the Pharisee and the Essenes at that time. The, the Essenes derived from that movement and they remained in in that wilderness area, their base where they fled to. I am of the belief based on my study, it can be debated because of there are some uncertainties, but I'm convinced for myself anyways, that Qumran, the site of Qumran, is the actual place where the Maccabees uh, rallied their first place and that was their main base. And so the Essenes, after the Maccabees broke up, the, the Essenes continued to, pres to preserve what the Maccabees tried to restore, that faith. And they considered themselves the, the one true group because early, um, according to their texts in the Dead Sea Scrolls, like the Testament of Levi and the Book of Enoch, those texts say that the priesthood failed and got corrupted and was no longer legitimate in near the end of the second century uh, BC. So basically around the time of John Hyrcanus, um, when John Hyrcanus uh, arose to power in the second century, he was basically the beginning of the destruction of the priesthood. And from that point on, the Essenes, based on Enoch and the Testament of Levi, did not accept the priesthood as authentic, uh, at least the high priesthood. Because we learn, we learn um, later on that, you know, based on history and the New Testament, that the priesthood became basically bought out by the Romans. And they began handing the, the high priesthood out for a fee to non-Levites. But according to the Torah, it has to be a son of Aaron, son of Levi, to, to be a priest and to be a high priest. So because this happened, they rejected the, the high priesthood of the Jews, the Essenes did, and then they also rejected the temple. The reason they rejected the temple was because in the first century, Herod changed the temple. He added on to it. He made his own additions to it. This, uh, if I, I believe I'm correct on this, this was the Herod that eventually ended up massacring all those infants and tried to kill the Messiah. This was the same Herod, so he was the one who um, who corrupted the temple completely. 
because according to the Essene documents and the Dead Sea Scrolls, there was a very specific measurement that the temple had to have to be considered holy. So, um, uh, the, the, uh, the Essene perspective is that the temple itself, the actual temple building, was corrupted by Herod. However, they still wanted to go to uh, Jerusalem into the courtyards to worship there and, and offer sacrifices because that's what the command is, to offer in Jerusalem at the altar. We learn, in, according to Josephus, that eventually the Essenes, even though they wanted to go there and do sacrifices, were banned by the Pharisees from the temple. And Josephus gives the reason why. He says that they had their own sacrifices that they did. Um, and that was part of why they were rejected from the temple. But so um, that was the origin of the scenes, in my understanding. The uh, I was t asked to address some things before we started, and one of them was were the Essenes Nazarenes. My understanding is that the Nazarene concept. Uh, it was referred to in prophecy, but there was no Nazarene movement until the Messiah came. Once the Messiah came, then the Nazarene movement arose. The Essenes, who were convinced that the Messiah was a uh, son of Mary, that he truly was Messiah, they became Nazarenes. But not all the Essenes converted to the Messiah. So those ones who did not convert, uh, who did not become Nazarenes. And um, in, in the Essene documents, there are several individuals referred to. There is a uh, someone known as the wicked priest, and the the teacher of righteousness uh, is referred to. And there is the um, smooth talkers, and there's other insulting things said about a certain a certain group. Um, okay. All right, so I'm going to have to wrap it up, and then um, we will try to hopefully do another session because there's so much more uh, to discuss. Um, but so to answer what Jackson had asked me before we started was basically this, that um, the teacher of righteousness was essentially held as a messianic figure. There are different interpretations of scholars as to who this uh, who this teacher of righteousness was. Most people, the, the, the problem is the, the scrolls do not give the name of who this person was. So the scholars are have to try to figure out who it was, but there's not a lot of indications of who it was, and it doesn't really match any of the historical details. But what's significant is that the details that they, the Essenes give for this teacher of righteousness figure, who was a messianic type of figure according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, they match strikingly with uh, the Messiah's life, the son of Mary. Uh, there are a lot of correspondences between it. So, um, at least for me, I identify the teacher of righteousness prophesied of in the Dead Sea Scrolls as uh, the son of Mary. And um, the wicked priest, I understand to be Caiaphas, who was the, he was, um, he persecuted the Messiah and ultimately uh, sought his death. Uh, he was the one who suggested that um, they, that he should be killed. Um, and John said that, that was a prophecy, uh, an unintentional prophecy by him. But so, um, if we do another session, which I hope hopefully we will do, um, I don't know, maybe tomorrow or sometime later in the week, or maybe next week, that's up to Jackson. Um, I'm basically, here's what I'm going to discuss next time. I'm going to discuss the Essene, more about the Essene beliefs in particular. Uh, among them, I'm going to be discussing um, their concept of the, they were the narrow path and what that meant to them. Extreme legalism. They, they were very legalistic, not in the negative connotation uh, that modern day uses, but they were very, like, they believed we were saved by our works and by our, our obedience of the law. And that's what I also believe. So I'm going to discuss their, their perspective on that. And then their view on Sabbath. They kept Sabbath more strictly than, than most people, um, so strictly that they would sometimes 
that they would sometimes not save people, people's lives because they didn't want to break the Sabbath. I'm going to explain, try to share, to help people understand that perspective and why they, why they were so strict about the Sabbath. And also I'm going to discuss their, that they will, um, their understanding of they have to die for the commandments rather than break the commandments. So if it's a choice between disobeying the Torah and dying, they will die because they cannot disobey. They don't believe it's okay to disobey to save your life. Um, I'll be discussing their understanding of extreme purity. They had a very extreme view of to be pure. Uh, I'll probably touch more on the clash with the Pharisees. I'll be discussing their understanding of, of communism, uh, which is a controversial subject, but that's very much a part of the Essenes. Uh, they have a very interesting conversion process that, that is a peculiar mark. I'll discuss that. They had their own system of government of laws for punishment. Um, I was with that in their views on marriage and sexuality and um, theology and eschatology and their view, their, some of their rituals like baptism and their bread and wine. And so that's what I'm going to mainly discuss next time. And the other thing, although I don't know if I'll have enough time that second time, we don't have to do an even third one. Uh, third discussion. I'm going to basically go through and show from, I'm going to give evidence that the Apocrypha, our scripture, uh, at least according to the Essene view of why they believe it is, and show evidence of the New Testament endorsing the Apocrypha and, uh, and other writings, having other Apocryphal writings, having connections, uh, to the Essenes, to basically prove, at least, or attempt to demonstrate that the Messiah and the Apostles were actual Essenes, that, that Messiah's faith was an Essene, uh, it's a reformation of the Essene religion. Almighty Father, we come to you tonight with blessing and praise for your name and for your person. And as we delve into these treasures tonight, I ask that you might bless especially our teacher, Bless our students as they listen, everybody that's going to be listening to this on the internet as well, and with the link, we pray that you would give us mercy as we go through the process of learning this client, and in the meantime, we'll give you all honor and praise in the name of Yahshua HaMashiach, Amen. All right, we'll turn it over to you, brother. All right. So, picking up from our first session, I just want to go through and give sort of a an overview of the books in uh, that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I wanted to give some more information about that because I discussed a lot of it last time, but I want to go into more detail this time. So, I've done an inventory of all the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found. I'm just going to go through that just to give everyone a, a basic idea of what was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. This list is not 100% exact. There are some uncertainties, but this is a very close approximation of the contents that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There were about 860 scrolls found. A large number of them were very fragmentary. Some of them were, were bigger fragments. A few of them preserved almost the entire book. So for instance, the Isaiah scroll, that was very significant and one of the first scrolls that were found, it pretty much preserved the entire book of Isaiah, showing that Isaiah, the book, has been well preserved all these thousands of years. With, with There were some differences, variants, but the variants in the version of the Dead Sea Scrolls were not major differences. But so most of the Dead Sea Scrolls we were not that fortunate to have virtually the entire thing preserved. Often it's just small pieces of fragments. So from what we have in the Dead Sea Scrolls, here's the inventory of what we're basically able to figure out. About 141 scrolls are impossible for me to identify for various reasons. Mainly the fragments are so small that the scholars didn't even bother to publish them uh, in accessible 
uh, versions and translations because that's how the fragment, like it might contain a letter or something in the fragment. So there, are, the scholars have identified about 141 different, what they believe are different scrolls, which essentially are impossible for us to identify. There are 81 scrolls which contain texts uh, that are currently un from un they are from currently unidentified books. So with more study and research, we may be able to identify some of these books. But right now, we can't really identify them at this time. 37 scrolls contain prophecies of currently unidentified prophets. So they are presented as prophecies from certain individuals, and we don't know who is who these prophecies are attributed to. With more research and study, we may be able to narrow down the possibilities. Now we have 31 phylacteries in Tepelum that were found. I mentioned this in the first session that we did. These were the, the binding, the commandments to your arm and your forehead. 31 of those were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Then we have about 29 copies of the Book of Deuteronomy. We also have 29 copies of the Book of Psalms. And we have 29 scrolls containing other apocryphal Psalms uh, claiming to be or presenting themselves as from David. 23, we have 23 copies of Exodus that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. 22 scrolls containing the Essenes' uh, beliefs about various interpretation of the law of Moses. 20 copies of Genesis were found. 18 copies of the book of Isaiah. 17 copies of the book of Leviticus. 16 copies of the book of Jubilees. And we, they found 15 copies of Damascus document. This was a text written by the Essenes. 14 copies approximately of community rule. This was another foundational text by the Essenes. 14 scrolls were found which contain, contain uh, the, the calendar of the priests. So it's a priestly calendar listing the priest cycles and corresponding them with the calendar that the Essenes used. So we have 14 scrolls containing that kind of information. Then we have 14 scrolls containing apocryphal wisdom. So it's various wisdom similar to Solomon, but we don't know who these words of wisdom are attributed to. It could be Solomon or it could be some other unknown sage. But so we have about, we have 14 scrolls containing different wisdom words. We have 13 copies of the Book of Enoch. We have 10 copies of the Temple Scroll, which is a version of the Book of Deuteronomy. We have 10 copies of, and 10 of the, of David. 10 copies of the 12 prophets. We have nine copies of the Book of Giants and nine of Apocryphon of Jeremiah. We have eight copies of the War Scroll and eight of Thanksgiving Psalms of David, eight copies of the Twelve Prophets and eight copies of Daniel. They found eight mezuzahs. Those are similar to the phylacteries I mentioned, except those you were to hang on the walls of your, your dwelling places. So we found eight of those in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Eight scrolls were found containing commentary on the book of Genesis. There were seven copies of the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs found, seven copies of the Book of Instructional Wisdom, that's what scholars refer to it as. Um, it's just a book of wisdom that someone wrote, we don't know who. Seven copies of the Pesher to Isaiah. There were seven copies of an Apocryphon about Daniel, seven copies of an Apocryphon of Joshua, seven copies of community blessings and prayers, six copies of a prophecy about New Jerusalem, six copies of the book of Ezekiel, six scrolls containing Moses' Apocrypha, so extra stories about Moses, six copies of the book of Job, five copies of the Testament of Amram, five copies of an Apocryphon of Ezekiel, five copies of First and Second Samuel, five copies of Tobit, five copies of Blessing Psalms of David, 
four scrolls containing messianic prophecy, four copies of Jeremiah, four copies of the book of Judges, four copies of a prophecy of mysteries, four copies of Pesher to the Psalms, four copies of prophecy about Joseph, the tribe of Joseph, four copies of the book of Ruth, and four of Lamentations, four of Song of Solomon, three copies of First and Second Kings, two scrolls containing words from some of the patriarchs, three copies of the festival songs of David, three scrolls containing historical references to the Maccabean era, three scrolls containing lists of names, two copies of Songs of the Sage, two copies of the Book of Joshua, two copies of the Book of Proverbs, two of Ecclesiastes, two of an interpretation of prophecy, two scrolls containing quotations of scripture, two copies of a prayer meditating on biblical history, two copies of an Apocryphon of Samuel, two copies of an Apocryphal Chronicles of the Kings of Israel, two scrolls containing ages of creation, two scrolls containing curses, and this is a little bit tedious, but just um, wanted to share this information with you all so that you're well informed. Um, and the rest are, is all one copy, okay? So there was a book of Lomech, a book of Noah, a book of Abraham, a testament of Koath, there was a revelation of the archangel Gabriel, the copper scroll, four songs of exorcism by David. There was a copy of Petariza and Begazro. There was a copy of First Maccabees, a copy of the Wisdom of Sirach, Epistle of Jeremiah, Prayer of Manasseh. There was a commentary on Melchizedek found. There was one copy of the book of Ezra found, and there was one copy of the book of Nehemiah. There was one copy of the First and Second Chronicles, one copy of an apocryphon of Michael to Malachi, a copy of prophecy about the coming of Elijah, a copy of a chronological text. There was a Be Beatitudes prophecy. There was a Two Ways text, a prophecy about the judges, one of an unknown seer. There's three more left. One of a parable text, one of a blessing text, and one of a lit liturgy office. So the list is very long, but it just goes. It just shows you how rich the literature of the Dead Sea Scrolls was and how many books that they treasured. What's also very significant about this list is that a lot of their books, they have way, they had way more copies of it than some of the, bi the biblical books. The scholars tend to, have to agree that the more copies they had, the more the community there revered the text. So when we have, we see that the the Torah, the Law of Moses, and the Book of Psalms and Isaiah are very high on the list. They had a lot of copies of it. Uh, but we also, they also had a lot of copies of the Book of Jubilees and Enoch and some of their own writings they had many copies of. A lot of their extra biblical books, as many refer to them, they, ha they seem to have treasured those books more than books of the regular Bible based on how many copies were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, almost all other writers are dependent on Josephus and Philo, basically quoting his own words. Uh, so, Josephus and Philo both lived in the first century, and they were both Pharisees, but they both admired the Essenes and considered them uh, virtuous Jews trying to obey God. And they had so much respect for them, and they wrote detailed presentation of their their uh, their faith so i'm not going to read to you what they said rather i have prepared my own assessment of information that they have said as well as what can be gleaned from the dead sea scrolls so judaism in ancient times was divided into three main denominations. There were a lot of splinter groups that were smaller, but the three main ones were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. And this seminar, of course, is all about the Essene denomination of Judaism. So there were two main orders of the Essenes. There was an order of marrying Essenes, so Essenes who believed in marriage and, um, and they, they sought out marriage. There, the second order was a group of non-marrying Essenes. Well, and they also, these non-marrying Essenes did not have servants, whereas the marrying Essenes did have servants. 
Now, what we're told by these writers is that, uh, Josephus and Philo, that is, were told that they did not condemn marriage altogether, but they, for themselves, this, the order that, of the Essenes that did not marry, they did not want to get married for their own reasons. And there was, uh, so for those who did not want to get married, there was about 4,000 of them. And from what we can tell, based on the, the, those writers, these 4,000 Essenes who did not want to be married, they all lived uh, at Qumran. Because when they looked and discovered that they dug up some cemeteries at Qumran, and they were pretty much all male, all male skeletons. There was only a couple female skeletons, and these female skeletons were far apart from the main cemetery. So in the main cemetery, they found 1,100 dead bodies, and they were all males. So this indicates that the people who were living there were a all-male society. But their writings that they have do not command people to be celibate. So we know that the Essenes at large were not against marriage, but the Essenes valued the celibate life. There was a third order of Essenes, and this was the group known as the Therapeutae. And uh, Philo mentions the Therapeutae, and Eusebius, uh, the church father, quotes from Philo, and the Therapeutae, basically, they were all about a, a higher devotion to God, similar to the, Na the Nazarites, voluntarily cutting off things that they didn't have to, and this made themselves more holy. So this third group was basically the origin of what is known in Christianity as monks. So the Essenes are the origin of this monk's order. And what's very interesting is Eusebius, the church father, he was convinced that these Therapeutae were Christians. And why was he convinced? He says in his book, he says, because everything Philo says about these Therapeutae, to this day, our monks do everything to the exact detail of what of Philo's description. So this is a major connection between Christianity and the Essenes, for the Therapeutae were, as far as we can tell based on what Philo said, uh, they were an Essene order. So this is one of the many connections between Essenes and Christianity. Now, the origin of the Essene movement was basically this. In the second century, when everything went down with Antiochus, the, the enemy of all Jews, there were many who were repenting and wanted to restore the Torah. The ones who were the most righteous of these who wanted to restore the Torah, these became the founders of the Essene movement. Now, what happened is they fled from the main cities to the wilderness to seek refuge for themselves from Antiochus' people. And that was where they started with their base to protect and save and restore Israel. Now, in this wilderness place, after the Pharisees uh, broke up with them, the Essenes established a new covenant. Now, this place, some scholars debate this, but this Qumran seems to be the place that their documents refer to as Damascus. So this place was this was formerly known by the name of Damascus, the city of Damascus. Um, now it's known as Qumran. But so they established a new covenant in the city of Damascus. And what's very interesting and significant is in their own writings, they say they went into the wilderness in order to prepare the way of the Lord, which is exactly what John the Baptist uh, is described as doing in the New Testament. There are many people who are convinced, many scholars who are convinced that John the Baptist was an Essene. There's a lot of connections, especially the emphasis on baptism and his peculiar uh, theology which and his clash with the Pharisees. There's a lot of things that scholars connect with that. Um, yeah, I, um, so, let's see, um, so what's very possible and seems to be the case is that John the Baptist started out in the scene, and that's where he inherited the idea of preparing the way of the Lord. So what's interesting, though, is that 
it's much diff more difficult for people to come to the conclusion that the Messiah, son of Mary, was an Essene. However, it's much easier for people to come to the conclusion in regards to John the Baptist. Even though there is much more evidence connecting the Messiah, son of Mary, to the Essenes than there is for John the Baptist. But because, because uh, Yeshua is, is a more controversial figure, people don't want to label him as coming from a particular group, because then that means they have to change some of their ideas. Um, but so what I'm going to try to show in this and in future, if we do future sessions, I'm going to try to show convincingly that the Messiah was an Essene, and that his religion that he uh, gave to the apostles was, in effect, the same religion as the Essenes. It was just a re slight reformation of it. Uh, so... The Essenes, they had to, they were required to make an oath to return to the law of Moses. And it was an all volunteer community. So they did not want anyone who was forced to be in their religious group. So anyone who freely wanted to join, they could join. And those who did not want to join, they were not forced to stay, but they were allowed to leave. And they only allow the repentant to be baptized. And what's really interesting is they taught a view of baptism that's very similar to what the New Testament taught. And another amazing connection with the New Testament and the Apostles and the Messiah is they referred to themselves as the way, the, the, the group of the way. As far as I'm aware, no other Jewish group refers to themselves as the way. And only in the Dead Sea Scrolls do we see that term being used. It is used in the Apocryphal Psalms of David. He describes the way. And it's also used in the Essene writings um, of the, for instance, in Community Rule. Community Rule was a text they wrote about the rule of their community, how it was to be ordered. And they use this phrase, the way, as a description of their own group. So that's an amazing connection. Now, the Essenes had a very peculiar process of conversion. They sought out primarily the poor and especially orphans, and they sought them out to become proselytes. Now, the Essene conversion process was, a, in, in the entirety, a three-year conversion process. In the first year, they studied about the Essenes and what the faith of the Essenes required. Now, after the first year, if they still wanted to continue and they were still interested in becoming an Essene, at the end of the first year, they were given some gifts. They were given three gifts. They were a white, a white uh, garment, there was a girdle, a linen girdle, and there was a special rake that was, that was given to them. This rake uh, was to be used to, uh, to dig up dig up the dirt so that they could go to the bathroom in the desert. And that was something very special to the Essene movement. Um, so, let's see here. So after they were given the gifts, they were also allowed to start participating. They were allowed to enter into the mikvah of the Essenes. Before the first year was over, they were not allowed to to use their place of water because their place of water was holy and only to be used for cleansing Essenes. So this water is not allowed to be used for non-Essenes. But after the first year, they are joined to the Yahad, which is what they refer to themselves as, the community. Yahad means the one or the unity. So they refer to themselves as the unity or the community. And so after the first year of the conversion process, they were joined to the Yahad. But they were not fully joined. They had two more years they had to go through. At the end of the second year, some of their possessions were merged, or not some of them, all of their possessions were merged with, uh, the, with the community. But it was not a permanent merger. So if the, if, the, if the proselytes decided to back out of it, he would get all of his possessions back. So it was joined into the community, but it was not used by the community yet. The reason they were starting to take in his possessions at the end of the year 
was at a test of his faith. Was he willing to part with his possession so far at this time? If after the second year he completes third year, then he can partake. He, he is now a full convert. He is the Essene, a full Essene, and he can partake of the holy food of the Essenes, and he is joined to the community in all ways. However, at the end of the third year, before that can happen, the community has to judge and evaluate whether the, the prospective Essene is worthy to become a full Essene. If the community judges that he is indeed worthy, then they require him to make some oaths. These are the oaths that are required to make. So, and this, these oaths seal the conversion process. They had to, they had to promise to be godly. They had to promise to seek justice and to do justice for all people. They had to take a vow of harmlessness. They were not to harm others. They took a vow of deserved compassion. What did they consider deserved compassion? In their writings and in what Josephus refers and describes them as believing, they believed that those who were those who were deserved, who were innocent deserved to be to be helped. Those who were not innocent were deserved to not be helped, and they were to be hated. Now, why did they hate the hated the wicked, and why did they hate the wicked? The reason they did was because of the Old Testament. You'll see in the Old Testament, for instance, in the book of Psalms, you see David say, I hate them with a perfect hatred. I hate those who hate you with a perfect hatred. I don't remember which psalm that is, but you can find it with a simple Google search. And there are many other passages in Scripture which describe the righteous hating the wicked and God himself hating the wicked. And yet, there are other passages which, passages which say to love to love the wicked and that God loves the wicked. So it seemed at first to be a contradiction or an inconsistency at least. But the reason we're to hate and love is because we are to hate everything bad about them and we are to love everything good about them. And everyone has certain good qualities that we are to love, certain rights that they deserve. Even if they're the most wicked people, they deserve to have those rights respected. So. But so they they uh, took a took a vow to to hate those who were wicked, and to help those who deserve to be helped, who were innocent. Now, in the homilies of Clement, that's a book, that's a different version of the one that Jackson has shared with you all, the Nazarene Acts of Clement. And in the homilies of Clement, we are we see that according to the Apostle Peter and the Messiah himself, it's a sin to heal a Gentile. A Gentile can only be healed if they are if they are innocent. So if they are guilty, the punishment they have or the disease, the sickness that they have, is actually God's punishment on them. So if we are, if we heal them, then we are in effect we are opposing or rebelling against what God has ordained. So for those who will repent, the Gentiles who repent, they are allowed to be healed. Uh, so that's what the Essenes believe. Next, they took a took an oath of faithfulness to all. They were to be faithful with everyone, and they also took a oath of loyalty to authority. What's really peculiar is in the New Testament we see Paul say that we are to submit to the governing authorities because no government is ordained except by God's will. This is exactly what Josephus says the Essenes believed, that no government is, uh, all, every government established was ordained by God to be established, and so we are to, we are to, if we are under the rule of that governing authority, we are not to, to rebel against it, uh, unless they cross a certain line, which then rebelling would be allowed. But so they vowed to be loyal to the governing authorities. They vowed to have true leadership. For all the scenes who were eventually to be in a position of leadership, they had to, at the beginning of their, con at the end of their conversion process, they had to, to vow that they would be true leaders, that they would righteously rule. And they had to vow to have a humble appearance. So the clothes they wore had to be very simple. They couldn't be overly glamorous. They couldn't have a lot of fine jewelry. They weren't supposed to do all this 
fancy ornaments to make themselves look nice or to make themselves above other people. They had to take a vow of truth. And what this entailed, according to, according to Josephus, was to love the truth and to reprove liars. So those who were liars and lied themselves, they tried to over, overturn and to expose the truth. They also took a vow about secrets. They believed that as a family, as a community, they were not to have any secrets from one another. They were to share the information with each other. Everything as a family. They trust each other. But they also took a vow of the secrets of the community were not to be shared with anyone. They were not to be shared uh, with those who were not, who were not saints. So they, they had a very strong emphasis on loyalty to the community family. There was also an oath about the Essene tradition. They vowed to, to not teach others contrary to what the Essene tradition requires and to not excuse me, misrepresent to others what the Essenes believe. So they vowed to be faithful to the Essene religion in all, in all particulars. And they also took a vow about the scriptures, the scriptures of the Essenes. They vowed to protect them with equal reverence to the other scriptures. And they also vowed to not expose all of the, the scriptures of the Essenes to those who were outsiders. So these were the, the oaths that they were required to take. And once they took all these oaths, then they were approved and they became full Essenes. Now, the Essenes taught a very peculiar thing that is very difficult for most people to accept, and that is they were extremely communistic. They were communists. And what does this entail? They taught that they were to, the person who was becoming an Essene was to sell all his possessions and give the money of those possessions to the community stock. All the possessions of the people that were given to the community stock, everyone's possessions were to be in common. No one was to own anything themselves, but the community was to own everything. Uh, the possessions and money and everything that was theirs was to be everyone's. There was basically an elimination of class distinction. So the goal of this was to uh, eliminate poverty and no one was considered rich because the, the riches of the rich person actually belonged to the entire community. These, the Essenes despised riches. They like, were very strongly opposed to, to wealth. Now, there were stewards appointed to make sure everyone got the things they needed. Uh, so the food, clothing, and whatever people needed, there was a stewards appointed to make sure of that. All business of the Essenes was community oriented rather than individual oriented. So basically there was no private or small business, but there was community business. Now all Essenes were welcomed and accepted into the community family, even if they were from another city. So Essenes from everywhere were welcome and they were treated as family, even if they didn't even know who that person was. As long as they were on a scene, they were, they were just automatically welcome and treated as if they were best friends or if they knew each other for the longest time. Now, what we're told by Josephus and Philo is that the Essenes had more brotherly love and affection for one another than the, all the other Jews. Uh, what Josephus says is that the Pharisees did have an affection for one another. They, they were very well disposed to one another, but not to the extent that the Essenes were. The Sadducees, however, were, were very hostile to one another. And so when I say the Essenes were, had a lot of brotherly love and affection, that refers to Essenes, so they loved their Essene brothers. Um, let's see. They, when they traveled places, they did not carry anything with them except what was absolutely necessary for their safety. They were allowed to carry weapons on their person, uh, they, and whatever was necessary, the minimum necessary they took, but they took nothing else with them. And the reason was because they didn't need to take anything with them because when they went to another city where the other Essenes were, they could, they were able to take whatever they needed from that place. So it was all a very, it was all a very wonderful system for these people because they did not have to worry about supporting themselves in a time of need. They, when they are in trouble, they have the community to help them and support them. Now, one, there was one appointed to take care of strangers 
or foreigners. There was one in every Essene community that was specifically appointed for that purpose. And every one of these scenes, they only had what they needed and no more than was sufficient. So for instance, we are told that the Essenes actually, they only had one set of clothing per season. So really, no one needs more than one set of clothing. They just need something to wear. So the Essenes had the idea that, okay, all we, we have our clothes, we have a shirt and the pants, or you know, I don't know what they wore back then, like a robe or something, but they, and they had the shoes. And what we're told is that they kept using the same clothes over and over again until they were worn out and needed new clothes. Then they, they got new clothes. And, when, and we know that the clothes were all owned by the community. So whenever they needed new clothes, they could just go to the community and say, I need new clothes, can you help me out? And then they would give them for free often. Um, now, no debts or repayments for the poor in need were required. So whoever was in absolute need, they did not require debts or repayments for them. So they could take freely. So in the gospel, what's interesting is that he says, let people take take a, a cloak and, um, hold on, I want to make sure I'm not mixing it up. One of the books, I don't know if it's in the New Testament or maybe it's Didache, uh, says that you are to give and not to not to seek it, it back. You're not to seek them repaying you. You're just to give freely. And and I do know in the gospel it says if someone uh, takes your garment, give them your coat also or something to that extent. So there's many similar ideas. And in the New Testament, there's so many, there's so much emphasis about, for instance, there's opposition against the rich. We see James strongly oppose the rich. And the Messiah said, when someone asked him, what must I do to be saved? Uh, at first he told him to obey the commandments. And he said, I have done that. I have obeyed the law of Moses. What else then do I lack? And then he said, go and sell everything you own, and then you will be perfect. In other words, he was implying that he had to sell everything he owned and to be in a community like this, and then he would be perfect. This man did not found this too hard to accept, and he went away sad, the gospel says, because it was too much for him to accept. And then the, the disciples there took, were also very blown away by the statement and said, who then can be saved? And he said, with men, things are impossible, with God, but with God, things are possible. And he, he said, it's harder for a rich man to be saved than for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. And in Messiah's view, and in the Essene view, someone who was rich is someone who owned or had more than they needed. And when someone else did not have what they needed. So when there was someone out there in need, and you had excess and you could help them, but you didn't, and you kept it all to yourself, that was being rich. And it is harder for a rich man to enter kingdom. So that was, uh, that's the connection there. And but let me just say this. There's passages in the Law of Moses and in the Bible all throughout that talk about money and seem to imply a system of that's not communism. So how does this reconcile? Well, according to the Essene teachings, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls and what Josephus and Philo say themselves, it seems that it was not when it was communism, it was in effect it was all all the possessions belonged to the community, but the people who who, like, for instance, it says they were to sell all that they had and give that money to the community. But basically, whenever that happened, you didn't lose all that money. You actually had, you had more access to it than everyone else in the community. So it was primarily yours. It was still primarily yours. It was under your name. So you actually had, each person had an account. And whenever you needed something, it would be subtracted from your account. And so you would, all your money was still under your name, but it first belonged to the community. So if the community ever had a need, that need of the community trumped your ownership of those things. But otherwise, it was all yours to still use. Uh, so it was it was communism, but not communism in the sense that you didn't you didn't own anything. You still own things in a sense in that you they were on loan to you in effect. It was. It was leased out to you. That's a good way to put it. And the lease was basically 
continual until your death, as long as you respected the rules of the community. So they were, in effect, your possessions, but technically speaking, they did not belong to you. They actually belonged to the community. Um, so now nothing, Essenes could not give gifts to their friends or family or to anyone without the, uh, the authority or the granting of their overseer, except they were allowed to give of what they, of their lease, everything that was in their lease, they were able to give to those who were in desperate needs and to fulfill moral obligations. So there were basically when the, when the law of Moses and when morality itself requires you to, to help those in need, then you could give to others. There was an annual review of the community on Shavuot. Basically what they did on Shavuot was they renewed the covenant. They redid all their oaths and that actually is based on what the Book of Jubilees says. The Book of Jubilees implies that that's what you're supposed to do every Shavuot, to renew the covenant. And that's what they did. So there was also the religious festivals of the community were according to the solar calendar, based on what the Dead Sea Scrolls indicate. And this was very much a part of the community life. They had to go and abide by the calendar of the community. The there was no yoking of business or wealth with non essenes So you were not to have a business partnership with those who are not of the community. And you're not to share wealth with them. You're not to share possessions with them because all of your possessions are to belong with the community. Now, if you share a possession with a non essene then you cannot have that possession as part of the community because it actually belongs to someone who's not part of the community. So they would, they would, opposed to that. The person who is not an Essene convert, they would say, no, no, that's mine. You can't take that from me. So we, we would not have a right to take in something that an Essene has a, shares wealth with someone who's not an Essene. And uh, there's no buying or selling without permission of the overseer. So whenever you wanted to buy or sell something, what you had to do was you had to get permission from your overseer. And when the overseer gave you permission, then he allocated to you your funds from your, your account. So you would receive the money, and then you would use it to buy or sell whatever the overseer approved of. And no one could be brought into the community except by permission of the overseer. So if you had a friend or family and they wanted to visit, you say, okay, come over to my house. I'll bring you over to my house. The, the overseer could say, no, he's not allowed to go into your house. And why? Because the community owns that house. It's not just your house, but it's everyone's house. And if the overseer does not approve. So the overseer is the representative of the, of the community. And so if the leadership of the community does not approve of people coming to their community, they can prevent that. So then there's uh, their wages of two days. Now they had work. They did work every day and the wages, except on the Sabbath, uh, the wages of two days of every month were given as a tax. This tax was not part of your lease. You could not, you could not receive it back. This was, in effect, you handing over as payment to the overseers for the work they're doing, maintaining the community, just like we have for mayors and uh, governors in the United States, of, United States of America, we pay the taxes. And these taxes are the, supposed to be the payment for the leaders, but also to be used to help the poor and to help the community. So that's the main thing about communism controversial thing there. <laughs> so next, I'm going to describe the daily routine. The basic daily routine of the Essenes was this. They had a, they started out the day with a dawn prayer. They prayed in the dawn. They had to wake, they had to wake up. This was actually a requirement, not just a volunteer thing. Everyone had to wake up before sunrise and they did prayers and singing for the sun to rise and to start the day. Throughout the day, they did their jobs, and their jobs were the job assignments that the overseer assigned to them. So they had job assignments based on their level of expertise, judged by the community leaders. The community leaders looked at everyone's skills, and they appointed jobs based on your abilities. They had extreme emphasis on husbandry, so they, were, they focused their work on farming and animal raising, now, every day, they at lunchtime in the sixth hour, 
They went into a special building. Now, this building, we are told by Josephus, the Essenes viewed as a holy place, a temple. And they had to put on sacred white garments. They considered these white garments sacred. And whenever they did a, a holy activity, they had to put on these white garments. And these were the same white garments that they were given when they converted, that I told you about. They were given the girdle, the garment, the white garment, and the, the rake. So they put these white garments on, and immediately after putting them on, then they were baptized into water. After being baptized, then they went into a special room where the holy meal was a holy meal of bread was prepared. When they went into this room, they were very quiet. They were orderly. And they did not speak unless they were given permission to speak. So when they went to the room, they were all quiet, never spoke. And then the priest prayed before and after the meal, saying grace. And then they would eat the holy meal. What's amazing about this is this is an exact description of what we see in the New Testament and various Apocrypha. For instance, the Didache. In the Didache, which claims to be written by the Twelve Apostles, we see that before their holy meal of bread and wine, the Eucharist, they did a prayer of grace. And then after this meal, they also did a prayer of grace. What is unbelievable also is there's a book called the Acts of Thomas. It's an apocryphal text, but in it, we see that after Thomas converts people, what he has them do is put on white garments, be immersed into water, baptism of water, and then immediately after, they are given a meal of bread, a holy meal of bread. This is an exact correspondence with what the Essenes here are described as doing, based on what Josephus said. And so this amazing connection right there. They did this holy meal every day, twice a day, lunchtime and supper at least on the days of the week, uh, days of the work week. And so they did this in, in evening as well. Now, the, the first third of every night, so one third of every night, they were required to go to the, the same building and have a worship service. And they would read the, the scriptures and they would teach the people, uh, the from the prophets and various esteemed understanding. Next, I'm going to discuss marriage and passions. So, Essenes had a tendency to neglect or be wary of marriage, but they did not absolutely reject marriage, as I said before. Now, the ones who did not marry, they had a very negative view towards women by, uh, basically, they thought most, pretty much all of them were unreliable. They were generally, they were characteristically unfaithful. There's many writings in the Dead Sea Scrolls that present women in an unfavorable light. The Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, this particular, most of the Testaments were not found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but one of the Testaments which was not found is the Testament of Reuben, and in it, it, it says that the Spirit of the Lord told Reuben, the son of Jacob, that women are more overcome by the spirit of fornication than men are. So this would be a type of text that most likely the Essenes had in accepted, and this was kind of the mindset of some of these Essenes, that women are very dangerous, you have to be aware of them. Not all Essenes were like that, but a lot of them to protect themselves, because most of the women out there, the Gentiles, and many even of the other, of the Pharisee women, were considered a major obstacle to righteousness. And what's very interesting also about this is that there are almost all the apocryphal acts, so what I just mentioned, the Acts of Thomas, the Acts of Paul, the Acts of Peter, Acts of Andrew, Acts of John, pretty much all of these apocryphal acts, they do not actually condemn marriage outright, but they basically say marriage is a horrible, like, not horrible, but it's like a huge risk, and you're better off not marrying. And it would be, you would give yourself a lot of trouble if you're, if you're going to enter a marriage. So these apocryphal acts have amazing connection with this idea of the Essenes, that, you know, it's just better, better not to marry, avoid all that trouble, and just focus on, on doing God's work all the time. So, for, for the Essenes who did marry, however, full marriage was not allowed until both the woman and the man were full Essenes. So they had to be full converts, first of all. Second, according to the Essenes, there was a two-stage process. The first stage was betrothal. The second stage was the completion of the betrothal and it was the actual marriage. The actual marriage was not consummated until they had sexual relations. So up until that time, 
the betrothal could be ended. It was, would not be considered a true divorce because it was not a full marriage yet. But once they had sexual intercourse, then from that moment, as long as they were betrothed, from that moment, their marriage was sealed. So also, they did not seal their marriage until their, their wives had three consecutive menstrual cycles. They had to menstruate three months in a row. Why did they require this before they slept with the, the woman? Because they believed, based on what the Dead Sea Scrolls say and what Josephus says, they believed that sex was only to be done for procreation, so to have children. It was not to be done for pleasure. However, I do believe, I don't say this, but I, for myself anyway, I believe that for it's not the pleasure itself that's bad, but it's for the mere pleasure. So as long as you're procreating, it's fine to be, have pleasure, but you have, it has to be about, it has to be for its purpose. So that's what they believed. But a very difficult thing to accept. The same apocryphal text that I mentioned about the, the act of Thomas and the other acts that I mentioned, they teach the same thing. They teach to not, to, to not have sex for pleasure only. And this got people so mad that when you look at these acts, a lot of the apostles were killed. They were martyred solely for teaching this, that, that sex for pleasure only was not allowed. So this was a very controversial teaching, and it still is today, but that's what the Essenes believed. They also, in general, they opposed pleasure as evil, mere pleasure. Everything that's pleasurable has an intended purpose, and to do it only for the sake of pleasure is, a, is contrary to its intended purpose. That's what the Essenes believed. So they avoided seeking anything for the mere pleasure of it. They emphasized continence, and emotions were very strongly controlling people. So they, they taught to overcome and restrain your passions. They emphasized the proper use of anger, and they exercised perpetual sobriety. They always made sure they were, were of sharp mind and always ready to resist temptation. And they partook of a regular measure of, of food and drink. They did not eat excessively. They did not overeat. They tended to eat the same things generally. They just were a regular course of life. They did not, they only ate what was sufficient, perfectly sufficient for their, for their health and well-being. They did not seek overly glamorous food. Now, law and order, there was quietness and speaking in turn. When they were in community with one another, they were quiet and they spoke when the other person stopped speaking and they were given permission to speak. They did not interrupt each other. They were very respectful towards one another. And so that, that was a big part of it because it was all one community. And when you have so many people in, in a place like that, it would get very noisy and chaotic. But what the Essenes tried to do is eliminate all of that chaos by teaching a life of, of quietness and meditation. And so people, they were allowed to speak, but you speak when the right time is and to, to have fun and to enjoy yourself. And there are times to be loud, but they were very self-controlling and they didn't have outbursts. Now they also, they banned foolish laughter. So you were expected when in session in a holy worship service to not talk out loud in, during the service and also to not laugh, like to laugh out loud, unless the overseer gave you permission. So they were expected to have a lot of self-control. And they gave a punishment for those who were, did not have self-control. Now, the worst punishment you can get from the Essenes was banishment. Banishment occurred only for heinous sins. In other words, capital sins, sins that deserve the death penalty but the Essenes did not do the death penalty because they did not have the authority of the government to do so. So they replaced the death penalty with these banishment regulation. Now what happened with the banishment is that when the Essenes became, were becoming, when they became the Essenes, they had to make an oath not to eat any food that does not belong to the community but belongs to someone else. So this forced them, if they wanted to be accepted back into the community, it forced them to not eat any food from other people. They could only eat food from the wild. So many of them actually starved to death and died because they couldn't, they were trying to repent. And the only way to repent was to obey their oath 
and not to eat the food of other people. However, the people who are on the brink of death or who are close to starving, the Essenes, seeing that they were so weak and how they were trying to repent, they accepted these people back as repentance. So they were, they had mercy, but it was much less mercy than you see in most other groups. So they, they basically had a way of imposing, of imposing the death penalty on them without, without actually enforcing it. They basically made the other person deprive himself of food. And if they were still alive, they would be accepted back and begin the repentance process. Now, no, no government votes of the Essenes were made without the count of 100. Now, what's the account of 100? Based on Dead Sea Scrolls, we see that there was the 72 of Sanhedrin. So we had 72 leaders of the Sanhedrin. In their version of the Law of Moses, the king was to have 36 people of a special council. 12 of them were to be, were to be regular Israelites, 12 were to be priests, and 12 were to be Levites. And then there was the high priest. So you had the high priest, the king, the, the 36th council, and the 72 Sanhedrin. Altogether, this formed the group of 100. And they had to have this 100 in order to make these decisions, or else they did not impose these, these punishments on people. The judgments of the 100 that they did make were most accurate, they were just, and their determinations were unalterable. That's what, what Josephus refers, describes them as. So whenever they made a judgment, it was unalterable. This has connections with the Law of Moses, which what the Law of Moses says is unalterable because it's the law. Once a law is made, you can't change the law. That's the basic idea of the Essene understanding. Now, they, they honored God and the lawgiver, and they considered it blasphemy for those who did not honor God and the lawgiver. It's unclear if the lawgiver is Moses or someone else, which would be perhaps the the Son of God, God and the Son of God. Uh, it's not clearly specified. But so they were very emphatic about the, the law. If you blaspheme the law, then you deserve that. That's a capital crime in their understanding. Now they all taught to obey your elders or presbyters. That Greek is presbyters. The New Testament also emphasizes obeying the presbyters and. So in this way, there's similar, there was connections with the Pharisees because the Pharisees had a, a high view of the elders as well. Uh, so the elders had a level of authority, the chiefs of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They had, you know, the elders. A main peculiar thing that they, for their, their faith, the Essenes, is that there was a, a council of ten men. These ten men were of a special authority that they would make judgments for that specific community. And without the unanimous consent they would not do anything. So all ten had to agree on a judgment in order for something to be done. The ages of leadership were based on the law of Moses. And so the priests were between the ages of 25 and 60. The, the judges were between 25 and 60 as well. The, the overseers, however, were between the ages of 30 and 50. Another very interesting thing here about this connection with, with Christianity is we have writings which say that a bishop is not to be ordained, or in Greek that's overseer, so an overseer is not to be ordained until they're middle age. According to Torah, someone becomes old when they're 60 years old. So middle age would be 30 years old. So we have other apocryphal writings claiming to be by the apostles which say a bishop must be ordained at the age of middle age, 30 which agrees with what the Essenes say. And also Paul, out of the blue in one of his letters, says a widow must be 60 years old in order to enter into the order of widows. This is very peculiar and reflects a Essene type of idea of ages enabling you to enter into a certain group. So the Essenes also had a law of no spitting in the midst of a community meeting. That was important for them because it was a disrespect to do that in the community. We know that's un, an unclean act, action because in the Law of Moses, I think it mentions something about spitting and that makes someone else unclean in certain instances. So spitting can be a transfer of uncleanness. 
and it's a disrespectful activity to do in a holy place. And they also, they also, basically, apparently, there in ancient times there was like the equivalent of the middle finger. It was gesticulating with the left hand, and this in effect, basically, apparently, from the, from what scholars think, people in ancient times would use the left hand for unclean activities. So to gesticulate with the left hand would be, be to basically, like, would be a major insult to someone. Just basically saying you're unclean you're a dirty, filthy person, you know, that type of thing, like a middle finger. And they were not supposed to do that type of insult in a holy place, in a service. They, just in the New Testament, the Messiah tells us to be like children and to obey like children, to be, and to be innocent. The Essenes believe something similar, we're told by those people, they acted like children and their, their overseers worked to them as if they were fathers. Their overseers were like their fathers. And this has many connections with New Testament writings of the overseers being like a father to their to the people underneath them. Paul called himself, considered himself like a father to Timothy. Now they they basically submitted to, to their overseer as a totalitarian leader. Totalitarian has a negative connotation. But basically, they submitted to their overseer as having total authority over everything of their community, except when it contradicts the law. So when they teach something immoral or go against your rights, then you don't have to listen to what the overseer says. So otherwise, the overseer is supposed to have complete authority over the community life. The, they were divided, the Essenes divided into four classes. They were priests, Levites, Israelites, and proselytes. Now, they basically viewed it so that Gentiles, and this included proselytes, because the proselytes were not fully converted yet, they were not allowed to, like, they were allowed to, but if they touched them, they would consider themselves unclean. So, to touch a Gentile would make themselves unclean, and they would have to wash because of Gentiles living an unclean lifestyle. For instance, they, they, uh, since they're not obeying the law of Moses, their uncleanness remained on them, and it actually can contract to other people. According to the law of Moses, we see some of the uncleanness, if it's not removed, it remains on them, and it can still spread to other people. So the Essenes had a very high emphasis on cleanliness, and did not have a good view of Gentiles in that respect. They separated them. I actually live like this, and it's kind of sometimes overbearing at times, because of, in my situation, I, I do not live in a community, I live with my parents. So whenever my family uh, touches me, I feel, I feel obligated to have to wash myself before, before the evening. Um, I did not tell my parents or my family this because I did not want to offend them. But that's what I do pretty much every time. And they often touch me like once a day, like they, you know, say, like they hug me or something. But so that's the type of a scene lifestyle, lifestyle and a very extreme, kind of approach at life. And it's not easy for many people to accept that kind of strictness. They had a very peculiar rule of witnesses, which is an amazing agreement with the New Testament. This rule of witness was, if anyone was known to have willfully violated something of the law, they were not considered a reliable witness. This is what the Messiah's argument is when the woman was being stoned for adultery, or not being stoned, but she was about to be stoned for adultery in the Gospel of John. And he said, he who, has, uh, he who is without sin cast the first stone. Uh, so this is a striking agreement with what the Dead Sea Scrolls requires. It requires that the person be without any public sin. They have to be reliable publicly, or else they cannot be considered a reliable witness. Their witness will not be believed. They will need further evidence, not just their word, so they only trusted the word of people who were considered reliable witnesses. For those who were not considered reliable witnesses, they took what they said, but they needed more evidence because their word was, could not be fully trusted. So this is an amazing connection with what the Gospel of John says. Here is another amazing connection. In the Essene writings, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, for various sins that they did, the punishment was reduced rations, 
so you had reduced rations, and you were excluded from fellowship. So you could not partake. They emphasized the, few, the holy food. You could not partake of the holy food. We see this type of extreme view harshly in the New Testament. We see he mentions the Eucharist and says, Paul mentions the Eucharist and says, uh, there are some who, because of their sins, they partook of the Eucharist and then they died because of, as a punishment, or they got sick as a punishment for not respecting it and staying away. And Paul says, you don't hear this verse quoted from Paul too much, but he says in 1 Corinthians, if anyone is a fornicator, and he says a couple other sins, like coveter, various sins, not even, and they call themselves a brother, don't even eat with such a person. So he's saying, do not participate with them in holy meal. Do not eat with these people until they repent. It's striking agreement with the the uh, Essenes. And there is a, if I still have time today, or if not, the next session, if we have another one, I'm going to quote from you from a book that has not been translated into English yet, but it's the Revelation of Peter. It's in the Ethiopian Bible. And this book explicitly, like, it, it has a whole section of a book, each type of sin of, if you do this sin, you have to fast this number of days and then you, or weeks, this number of weeks, and then you are excluded for this number of months or years. And then you can return to fellowship and you can eat of the holy food again and be part of the fellowship. So this is like an unbelievable coincidence that has not been looked into by scholars before because this has never been translated into English, this text. It's the Revelation of Peter and that connection is unbelievable. But so the Essenes do what they can to avoid vain arguments and vain discussions with the wicked. So if a discussion is not going to be kept, it's not going to be productive, they don't they seek, they try at least not to participate in it. We see a lot of discussions on Facebook, especially in certain groups like No Holds Bar group, where there's a lot of discussions which are not productive. And basically not supposed to participate in these because we're actually causing people to, to blaspheme and we're told not to cause Gentiles to blaspheme the name. And so the Essenes were a much severer discipline than most people. They were very strict, above and beyond all other Jews, basically. They regarded oil as defiling. Not all oil was forbidden, though. Basically, what they did was if they, were if they used oil to anoint themselves, they, they sought to immediately wash it off. And the reason was because oil is a good conductor of uncleanness. As according to the Torah, oil can conduct uncleanness very easily. So they sought not to use oil much at all. They believe it's good to be sweaty. And this kind of applies in our life to, in our modern day because a lot of people try to create, try to make themselves popular or to, to present a good picture of themselves. And so they unnaturally stop themselves from sweating or they try to hide their sweat by using perfumes or deodorants, and a lot of these are unclean, unhealthy. A lot of soaps today, a lot of oils are toxic, unclean, just as unclean as pork, because some of them even have pork products in them. And it's just so that the this type of, there's a lot of uncleanness that can be in oils and soaps and things of that nature. So the Essenes used oils sparingly, and when they did, they immediately washed them off. This description of not using oils is according to one of the church fathers, this is something that James, now he was like one of the primary leaders of the, of the early church. And he was, according to the church father, he was, he did this very thing that the Essenes do, they abstaining from oils. So that's another amazing connection. James basically being an Essene, or living like an Essene at least, in this regard. Now, here is probably one of the main difficulties of people accepting the Essene faith, and that is their extreme view of Sabbath observance. We see in the New Testament, the Messiah says, if an animal falls into a pit, it's okay to lift it out. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, we see something basically the exact opposite. So how does this reconcile, or is it impossible to reconcile? And I'll say one thing before I try to defend my view on this, is that even if Messiah disagreed with the Essenes on this, he agreed with them on almost every other issue. So even though they might have disagreed on this issue of Sabbath, since he agreed with them on basically every other issue, he, he is still the Essene faith. Even if you personally cannot accept the view of the Essenes on the Sabbath, 
everything else just points to him being an Essene. So what about this? How does this reconcile? Well, first of all, when you look at what the New Testament says, he appeals to David of getting, getting food from the priests. But when we go to that story in the Old Testament, we see something very interesting, which people don't really talk about. In that story, the priest asks, the priest asks David and his men a question. He says, are you clean? Have you, have you slept with a woman in, a, in the past three days? And he says, no, I haven't. My men are clean. He says, okay, now, you can, now you're allowed to eat of the food. According to most interpreters, the, in, this story is an example of the law being disregarded and thrown out and all the laws not being considered because life was in danger, life was on the line. But this is contradicted by the fact that the priest said, basically he implied, if you've slept with a woman in the past three days, I'm not going to help you. Sorry. So he was not, in the priest's mind, he was not disobeying the law. He thought he was doing what the law required and not disregarding it. So there was not a concept of loosing the Sabbath, like many people are saying. Uh, so how do, what did Messiah mean then when he, said, when he cited the instance of David? Basically, according to the law of Moses, no one is allowed to eat food unless they are part of the household of a priest. The priests, according to Leviticus, I think it is, they could adopt people as part of the household. And if they're adopted, or if they're a servant and they're part of the household, then they can partake of the priestly food. This food being tithes, and I think, tithes and certain other gifts. So, in effect, this was like a technicality issue. Because it was an emergency, the priest basically said to himself, okay, David, I'm going to temporarily adopt David because he needs, I'm going to treat him like my, my household. I'm going to accept them as if they were my household. So it was like a, a technicality he was going on. Similarly, many times in the scriptures you see people being very tricky and deception, they use deception, but they use it in such a way that they, they do not lie. They word it carefully so that what they say is technically true, but they say it in a way that's easy to misinterpret because they want other people to think the wrong thing. So in a similar way, they, the technicality was that David was, was adopted into the household of the priests because it was an emergency. If it wasn't an emergency, then he wouldn't have been adopted. It wouldn't have been considered a true adoption. But because it was an emergency, then he was considered adopted. For similarly, what Messiah says, in the book of Jubilees, it says the only work allowed on the Sabbath is priestly work. So the Messiah basically argued, uh, sorry, basically argued that when people heal on the Sabbath, it's basically a priestly work. So they're a priest, so they're doing priestly work. So he wasn't arguing the Sabbath doesn't have to be kept. He was going on a technicality and redefining things, and the redefining was justified because it was an emergency. So they were doing priestly work. The healing is an act of priests, according to Leviticus. The, the, uh, the priests were to, to be healers of those who had leprosy. So the act of healing was attributed to uh, priestly work, which Jubilee says is allowed, but now what about the statement that the Messiah said of not lifting an animal out of a hole on the Sabbath? Several things that I'm going to, I'm going to make the argument, it might not convince people, but here's my perspective. First of all, in Hebrew, there's multiple words for different types of holes. So there can be a small pit, there can be a large pit, there can be a well, different things of that nature. So different types of holes, depending what type of hole this is, the gospel doesn't make that clear because it's in, in Greek, not in Hebrew. Secondly, some manuscripts, in some manuscripts it says a donkey lift out a donkey from a hole on the Sabbath. In other manuscripts it says lift a human from a hole. The Dead Sea Scrolls makes a distinction between a human and a beast of burden, like a donkey. Basically, humans were allowed to be helped more than animals were because it didn't take as much effort to, to help them out. But basically all you had to do was reach out to the human and the human could use his hands to pull himself out. Whereas with animals, like primarily a donkey, you could not lift him out yourself and you needed to use, the, the donkey could not reach out with his hands because he didn't have hands. So basically you had to use other materials to bring him out. But these materials 
had to be built. And according to scripture, building is not allowed, even by priests. So the priestly work of, uh, the priestly work is an exception to the Sabbath. But since building is not a priestly work, you cannot build things even to save life on the Sabbath. So I think it's possible that the, the original reading is that some English would say a human instead of a donkey, because a donkey would contradict the Dead Scrolls. Uh, but secondly, um, if if it was a if it was a small hole and there was like say a sheep or something, you could easily go in it and pick it up and lift it up. That wouldn't require any usage of of rope things like that. You have to build and prepare. So that I believe was allowed. So basically, what I believe the Messiah was saying is, if a sheep or a human falls into a hole, all you have to do is go in and get them out. You don't have to. You don't have to build anything. You don't have to do anything to break the Sabbath. You just go in, let them out. That's no, that's no violation of, you're not doing anything that's against the Sabbath. And it's a priestly work to, to help them. And so there were some Pharisees, and according to Josephus, the Essenes were the strictest in regards to Sabbath. However, I believe this is a oversimplification because we're told in other sources, like in the Talmud, there were two major divisions of Pharisees. There was Shammai and Hillel. And the Shammai was the more strict group. So I believe that there were some Pharisees who were really strict, like overly strict, even perhaps more than the Essenes. And there were probably some Essenes who also were overboard uh, about the, the Sabbath. So I believe that the Messiah was opposing people who went overboard and basically said, no healing is allowed on the Sabbath. But the Messiah said, no, healing in and of itself is not a violation of the Sabbath. It's a priestly work. So lifting up an animal that you can lift up easily without any need for, for preparing or building things to get it out. That's how is that a violation of the Sabbath? So that's kind of my take on it. That's the Essene perspective of the Sabbath. Very strict view, and basically, in the Essene understanding, breaking the Sabbath is unacceptable to save a life. Even even to save a life. But as I said, certain activities, if they're priestly work, make it okay to do it even though in normal circumstances it would not be okay. So, for instance, uh, the priests can, the priests actually prepare food, holy food, on the Sabbath. So, in a time of emergency, as a priestly work, you could prepare food on the Sabbath, or prepare medicine on the Sabbath, as long as you are not violating non-priestly, as long as you're not doing non-priestly work. So, that's the scene view on that. And that's very, as I said, very difficult for people to understand or to accept. Um, Jackson, how long do you think more that we'll have? You there? Sure, I'm here. Sure. Well, let me uh, see. Really uh, how, how long? About really about eight o'clock. So we need to be. We need to do about an hour and a half. So yeah, hour and a half. Yeah, half. So what? How much more we got? We got a time to wrap about it up. wrap it up. You said. Okay. So. Yeah. Um. So, I'm going to finish basically. I'm going to say a couple more things, and then I'm going to continue next week. This particular session, I believe, isn't as compelling as the next one because it was the introductory to what the Essenes believed. I'm going to show in the next. I'm going to show in the next one various apocryphal texts, which basically state everything I just said. And this is in the words of the apostles themselves. So I'm going to show you these quotations, and basically you're going to have to come to the conclusion that if the apostles wrote them, then they were Essenes, or they were not written by the apostles. But even if they weren't written by the apostles, they were clearly written by someone with Essene origins. I'm going to show, I'm going to, basically next week is going to finish up this, uh, next session is going to finish up this information, and it's also going to focus on the Apocrypha and showing that it is, uh, showing the evidence that it is scripture and that of its connections with the Essenes. Uh, let me see if I'll say anything else for today to share. Um, I think this is actually a good place to end it for today. Um, yeah, so I had, a, I had a lot of information, but it's, so much. So I think this is a good stopping point. Uh, thank you all for for participating again. I apologize for some of the uh, 
some of the tedious parts at the beginning, the list. Um, but I, th if you want, if you listen to this audio session, and then you listen to the next audio session, I think you're going to be blown away because the next audio session is just going to show you like how everything fits together and how it's like amazing, amazing connection. And the, I believe it proves the Essene faith. At least for myself, that's why I converted to the Essene religion. Excellent presentation, brother. Excellent presentation, brother. Thanks, Shalom. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you all for participating. Yeah, if, you have any, if any of you have questions, if any of you have questions, you can message me after you leave. Um, until next time. All right, brother. Thank you again. All right. All right, Shalom.